years and over the last year in particular with agents kind of becoming more in the public realm. I think it's just really captured people's um, imagination. People are now interacting with technology that can empathize with them, that can now conduct actions and tasks that are quite complex in many cases on their behalf. You could argue that a lot of these capabilities existed with traditional software engineering, but now through ChatGPT, I could do something or ChatGPT-like experience. I could do something quite similar without having to click buttons. It knows who I am. It's personalized. It has this natural conversational tone. And so that's really, I think, the, the net new play in terms of the accessibility of the technologies. So the difference between agentic AI and kind of regular AI or machine learning. So machine learning is the kind of practice you, you apply to large volumes of data and create a model. Let's say, for example, um, looking at loads of data about uh, house purchases. You might define a model that says, given a certain postcode, a certain number of rooms, um, a certain age of the property, we can expect that the house will sell for a certain value. What we kind of call AI is, is typically just a model such as that one, but the model is much, much more broadly trained to be able to say, you know, if, if a user asks a question, what is the most likely response? And then agentic AI is kind of like one layer above, which is, okay, rather than just simply having a model give you an answer to a question, um, could we then allow the model to actually take some kind of actions as well? Which in this example might be something like, what do you think a house in this area would go for? I think it would go for this amount. Would you like me to search for some properties on the internet that look like they would match those criteria? And then if you were to say yes, then you know the system would go away and it would do a web search and summarize the results for you. When we think about agentic AI uh, and compare it to you know AI before, I mean, the real big difference is that agentic AI, we talk about systems that can, you know, do things in the world. We've had robots for decades in, in, in factories and software, you know, did that, you know, controlled them. Uh, but now we have this combination of AI, machine learning, these large neural networks or foundation models being able to do things in the world, sometimes collecting information, sometimes doing transactions for you, and oftentimes in these, you know, longer multi-step sorts of things. And so that's really the difference that we're seeing. New technology is always pretty exciting, especially when you see something that you you haven't seen before and like the possibilities that open up to you. So like when generative AI came out and people were like, look, you know, I can give a document and it summarizes it and it synthesizes it, or it can write emails for me. Everyone gets super excited by the possibilities. And then after a while, you know, things calm down a little bit. Agentic is still fairly new, which is like, wow, you know, I can not only do this, I can send emails for you and I can check your inbox and I can clear your calendar. And it is quite exciting, the possibilities that are there. I think the interesting thing is like, which of these possibilities or what are the things that the technology can do that are actually realistic or going to be valuable or are novel and what are going to be like the actual challenges around doing, uh, doing that. So you see loads of people saying this is going to change the world, but still possibly not that many real world scenarios where things outside of certain industries or sectors have, have genuinely changed that much. We see these hype cycles with technology all the time, right? Any of us who have spent years in technology recognize there are times when people just start talking about something a lot. There usually is something really concrete behind it. In our research and you know in, in our work with clients, we do find that there's great potential for these you know, AI agents, oftentimes what we discover is that it takes some time to get from, you know, the, the hype to real impact. One of the reasons we see a lot of hype around AI agents is a funny one. There's technologies, there's deep learning uh, types of technologies we see in AI. You know, when we first deployed them, they actually didn't operate in the world. So to a certain extent, it's, you know, agentic AI is fixing a problem that was caused by the industry. And so that's why there's a lot of hype. But, you know, what we're finding is there's a lot more to capturing value using, you know, agentic AI or agents than just simply, you know, signing up for a license and, you know, saying, okay, go forth and, and, and operate. The biggest thing with agentic is we're just kind of throwing the word around to mean a lot of things. And... As a result, we are losing the specificity we need to actually implement something targeted. And I think we're definitely running into a bit of a hype bubble where uh, it feels like we're building agents for the sake of building agents, but we've forgotten a lot of the tried and tested lessons learned around the user's lived experiences. And they're jumping towards, hey, how do I have four agents? And now they're all going to work together in a team. And I want my agents to talk to your agents. <laughs> I mean, 
mean, one of the funny things is when you have a new technology, you know, it's it's the hammer and the nail thing, right? When everyone wants to use this tool for everything. What we found, particularly working with real companies, is that agents aren't necessarily the best solution for everything. For instance, if you want a deterministic result, something that you can guarantee was going to operate the same way every time, you might just use you know, what we would call a rules-based system, write these if-then statements, so you always get the same response. You know, again, this modern type of AI, one of the fun things about it is it's non-deterministic. You know, sometimes it will say something, sometimes it'll say a different. We want that when we want to have a conversation with a person. But if you're in a business situation where it's absolutely important, for example, for compliance reasons, that you do have exactly the same result, then maybe you don't want to use an AI-driven agent that does something different every different time. Agents are really exciting because they can be built pretty quickly. Um, and they can do complex things uh, with relatively few instructions. But the the challenge with the agents is um, the agents are only as good as how much training we give them. And sometimes agents are just an overly complex approach for something that perhaps could be solved with a simpler technique. If we know something is you know following pretty strict rules that follow you know an if then else pattern. Um, I don't need agents at all. I can just use, you know, some programming lines, uh, lines of code and execute that and that'll do just fine. LLMs are potentially very useful because you're pattern matching for certain types of uh, patterns. Where it's not necessarily the right technology would be if it's if it's something that simply is solved through more um, through simpler models. So, for example, let's say it, we're doing credit scoring. People have been doing it with, say, spreadsheets. Um, or kind of business rule systems for ages. The reality is you don't need something as as powerful as a large language model to do like basic credit scoring. So you'd be using um, a nuclear missile to kind of uh, swat a fly on that one. A very concrete example of using AI agents is in the customer service function of companies. Because you know, if a customer calls in or you know they they're texting in. You are going to get a lot of different, a variety of different things coming in uh, because people are using natural language. Because the you know questions that they might have about your products and services you know can range from the very simple to the very complex. What we've often found is deploying an AI agent in that context and connecting it with your proprietary knowledge about your products and services. And sometimes, again, you know, that agent can not only respond and act as a knowledge agent, but sometimes can actually ship something to you or whether or not it's, you know, start a reverse logistics if you have a return request. Oftentimes, just like a real contact center, you're going to have level one and escalations to level two. And the, the level two, you know, maybe the level one is an automated AI agent. Maybe level two is actually a, a person who can, you know, respond to the more complex or difficult or high consequence uh, requests. One of my favorite examples is a I've been spending a lot of time in the legal domain for the ability for us to work with a client and learn from the lawyers, learn from past cases, learn from how they do their work and work their magic um, and teach agents to do something similar to that um, was really exciting. And overall, what we found was using the right engineering techniques, using the right human centered design, we we're able to take that workflow and reduce it by 4x in terms of end to end time. Um, which of course is a massive productivity gain. And what it meant for that services provider is now they could actually expand access to that service by offering it at lower prices and moving down market into higher volume, uh, low margin business. The Agentic Mesh is an architectural feature that allows us to maximize the reuse of different cap foundational capabilities that power agentic workflows. And so to give you a concrete example, if I'm a company and I have multiple lines of business that are building agents, I do want to encourage these silos to reuse the same connections to common data sources, to common transactional IT systems, to common agents in the backend, because if they each build their own unique thing, now I'm going to see a accrual of tech debt, and that's going to be quite challenging to manage and costly to manage. And so an agentic mesh really prioritizes this notion of how do I maximize the reuse, 
maximize the discoverability of each of those foundational capabilities. So when my colleague, you know, who's sitting on the other side of, you know, of, of the US or Canada, um, they are going to be reusing what's already been built rather than building something yet again custom. Just like in a, a real organization, you'll have different people who are specialized in doing different things. When we look toward the agentic enterprise of the future, we can imagine AI agents specialized in doing different things. You might have an agent that's planning, for instance. You might have an agent that's interacting with customers. You might have an agent, for instance, you know, which is operating in the logistics and supply chain. And so the idea of an agentic mesh is simply you'll need some sort of technological substrate so all of these agents can coordinate and talk with one another. I think overall in the labor market, much like how we've seen with other past technology trends and innovations, it may feel like in the short term there is worries about jobs, but overall I think we're going to see this grow the overall productivity we see in the economy. And in terms of a skill level, I do think while you know humans will still be gainfully employed, um, what we'll be doing day to, day to day might look a bit different. Right. And I think already we're seeing that if you look at software development, those many software developers who are writing code, they may now need to learn a bit of the managerial capabilities where they're actually reviewing someone else's code, in this case, AI generated code, to actually reap the benefits of productivity gain. One thing that's potentially a challenge is a lot of the reasonably straightforward tasks increasingly can be passed over to agents and LLMs. So the initial scaffolding of some code or the initial research analysis and so on and so on. I think that creates a challenge for uh, more junior engineers, more junior developers, because they're essentially competing with systems that can go very, very quickly at very low cost. So what the long-term consequences of that will be, I don't know. One of the things that I think is still a mindset shift that's happening, it's like everyone is now a tech lead. You're not just an individual contributor creating code. You're responsible for reviewing the code that comes from other people and understanding how it fits holistically into a system and does it meet the sort of the standards that we're following. And there's this initial period of excitement where everyone's like, I can write so much code, I can do so many things. And then again, you get that sort of tech lead maturity of realizing, yeah, but every line of code is a is a liability. We actually want as little code in the system as possible. So there's a real mindset shift there. It's not just kind of switching yourself into a QA mode. It is more of a, a kind of tech lead type mode. Again, applying this to software, which is what's the overall intent of the system? How are we gonna solve these problems? How does it all fit together architecturally? <laughs> There are a lot of risks that go along with uh, AI agents, which are echoes of the risks associated with AI itself. Large language models are these foundation models. One of the things they are is, you know, quote unquote, non-deterministic. You know, they, they, they have a variety of outputs. And sometimes what that means is you might have, you know, when, in a chatbot, what we call a hallucination. Again, it's a you know, oftentimes a confidently expressed um, uh, opinion or, or, or comment, which is just untrue or unfactual. If you have agents that are interacting with customers, there are other risks that could come from reputation or, you know, the way that you interact. You know, you're perceived as rude or you're perceived as not being sufficiently empathetic. If you talk about an agentic mesh where you have, you know, different agents which are communicating with one another, Again, these are echoes of things we've seen in computer science, but you could have you know, what we call race conditions, where just the interactions between different agents end up you know, in a cycle, which is, um, you know, doesn't work uh, technically. So we can talk about guardrails um, in order to try to manage some of the risks of using AI agents. And one thing you can do is, and you should do, is continuously monitor the outputs that come out. And so sometimes you can even use a rule-based system to identify you know, for instance, if someone's using words that they shouldn't use, like a, a competitor name, for instance. And sometimes even you can use AI as its own guardrail. It's often easier, both for people as well as AI, to identify something rather than produce the right thing. So the whole idea of like agents checking agents, it, it can seem like the, the sort of the obvious solution to this problem. We've got a lot of agents writing a lot more code. All of that code needs to be tested. On the surface, it sounds like, you know, great, but really kind of from a methodology perspective, you're using a system you don't fully trust, which is an LLM, to assess the output of a system you don't fully trust. So this whole idea of kind of using LLMs to evaluate work is somewhat problematic. For a first line of defense or a first set of checks or, or, or whatever it might be, I think definitely it's essential. But I think actually evaluating the quality and output of work 
is extremely complex. Simply relying on an LLM to do this for you is inadequate and it's it's not enough. If we fully trusted LLMs, the judgment of LLMs, then we wouldn't need to, to do those evaluations um, in the first place. And then what you'll probably find is that the LLM doesn't catch enough of the issues you have. It might be the case that, you know, consistently it's missing certain things, in which case you'll try to improve it, you'll improve the prompts, or you might need to bring in a, another agent or a more specific model to deal with that. Um, but still, there'll come a point where you get to this kind of human evaluation process. I think there's many things that uh, enterprises can do to what I like to say is go slow to go fast, right? We want to use these technologies. We know they're going to be a huge uh, value creative lever, but we do need to kind of make sure we have the right risk controls in place. I've seen organizations set up, you know, cross-functional risk committees to really see how um, uh, the risk function and legal function can partner closely with use case teams to make sure that they're being thoughtful about the guardrails from day one and that they are picking the right vendors and that they are picking the right, you know, open source or closed source models. Mm -hmm.